Do you conduct a business in the Plenty Valley or surrounding area? If so, consider Plenty Valley FM 88.6 for your business promotion. Our rates are reasonable and results positive. Call 9404 during business hours for more information. Welcome to the podcast series Spaced Out Down Under, hosted by author, journalist Eden White and journalist broadcaster Denise Kuchmar. Spaced Out Down Under aims to give a voice to new astrophysicists, cosmologists and others in the physics and astronomy field to share their research and discoveries about what's happening in the cosmos. Episode 2 explores pulsar timing. We talk to astrophysicist in prep, Rowena Nathan, a PhD candidate at Monash University researching pulsar timing and multi-messenger astronomy. Rowena is a member of OSGRAV, the LIGO Scientific Collaboration and the Parks Pulsar Timing Array. Outside of her research, she loves doing public outreach and inspiring others to pursue STEM. Rowena, welcome to the podcast series Spaced Out Down Under. Thanks, Denise. Thank you for having me. Astrophysics relies heavily on physics. With physics high on the agenda, what kind of physics did you select when you first enrolled at Monash? Well, that's actually a bit of a funny question because I didn't study physics in high school. So when I started studying physics at Monash, I had to start with a catch-up course and I just discovered that I really loved it. So I continued with physics whilst also doing um, electives in astrophysics and I really found a passion for it there but found that I was much more drawn to space than I was to quantum physics or optics or even some of the more traditional physics like um, Newtonian physics I just found astrophysics so much more exciting than those ones and that's kind of what drew me down the astrophysics path. That's fantastic because if you have missed out if you really have missed out on doing that physics at high school you still can do it at a university level. Yeah, that, these catch-up courses. That's very true. And even um, if at university you don't choose physics, there are many PhD students and, and postdocs that I know that have come from engineering backgrounds and computer science backgrounds. So there's an opportunity to get into physics and astrophysics kind of at any level. Yeah, my careers counsellor at school convinced me to do chemistry. And I did love it when I did it, but I was very, very happy to change to physics. Eden. Rowena, welcome. Thank you. Um, it seems that um, pulsars are, are your love. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been handed to you uh, to research. Tell us a bit about pulsars. How would you describe them to people that know not, not a lot about pulsars? Um, sure. So pulsars are a kind of neutron star that pulsate regularly in radio frequency, hence the name pulsars. And I personally think they're the coolest objects in the universe. Right. They are uh, weigh as much as the sun, but they're as small as a city. So they're only about 10 kilometres across and they're spinning as fast as a blender. So it's really hard to even imagine objects like this because you don't see anything even remotely close in your day-to-day life or around Earth. But they're just these really extreme objects um, and they come from um, massive stars after they run out of fuel and they collapse. So they're like a neutron star, but are, are they emitting uh, radio waves or gamma rays from the poles of each, each end? Um, so they can emit either or. Most of the pulsars that we see emit in the radio frequency and that's actually uh, one of the big uh, scientific questions out there with pulsars. We don't really understand how such a high energy object is emitting in radio waves. We do also see gamma ray pulsars, um, but only some of them and some gamma ray pulsars also emit in radio so that's kind of um, a weird phenomenon and something that we aren't fully across yet but yeah only some neutron stars are pulsars because only some neutron stars emit those characteristic pulses. What do observations of pulsars tell us? They tell us a lot of things. I think uh, the most interesting thing about pulsars, which I'm sure we'll deep dive into soon, is that they're really amazing at being timekeepers. They rotate very regularly and so the main observation that we do of pulsars is pulsar timing where we use them to measure time and we observe uh, many of them across the galaxy and together they are almost as good at keeping time as atomic clocks. Pulsar observations are also really interesting because, as I said earlier, we don't understand how that emission is generated and so um, observing pulsars is going to be the key to unravelling that mystery. 
And in addition, um, pulsars are the densest objects in the universe apart from black holes. And so physicists that study condensed matter are very interested in what's going on inside neutron stars. And the only way we're going to understand that is observing them. And that will come from both observing them in radio frequency waves and also watching collisions of neutron stars um, in the gravitational wave spectrum as well. There's so many different observations you can make of them and there's a lot of science to be gleaned from doing that. How do pulses create their energy? Um, so I guess that question's kind of twofold. If we're talking about the energy that radiates out along the poles, that comes from the very strong magnetic and therefore electric fields around a pulsar. So when you have a magnetic field spinning that fast and the magnetic fields on many pulsars are like 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 15 gauss, so these are very, very strong magnetic fields, nothing like we can generate on Earth, um, then that coincidentally creates an electric field and so then you're spinning around um, uh, protons and and mm -hmm. electrons and other matter in that field and that generates a lot of radiation which is how the the gamma ray and radio frequency radiation is generated and then in terms of like traditionally when we talk about how a star creates its energy that would come from nuclear fission in the core and that's how the star holds itself up against the force of gravity and so in the case of neutron stars that comes from quantum physics principles and the fact that neutrons um, basically don't like to be close together mm -hmm. and so gravity is pushing them in and they're pushing out against the force of gravity. Why do gamma ray bursts emit from out of the poles of the pulses, why don't they just explode everywhere? Energy coming out of pulsars comes from the poles because that's where the synchrotron radiation is happening. Yeah. So that's the uh, the particles going around in circles, which generates that uh, energy. But gamma ray bursts actually um, are kind of are different to gamma ray pulsars. So gamma ray pulsars are these regular emission of uh, gamma rays but gamma ray bursts are usually a stochastic one-off very energetic emission of gamma rays and that comes from the merger of two neutron stars one of which can be either of them could be pulsars um, and that's called a kilonova and it's uh, these two neutron stars merge in a very energetic event and um, emit very very strong gamma rays from them yeah, that's kind of two-sided. That is, you've got your gamma ray emission from your pulsars that happens very regularly and then gamma ray bursts from the collision of neutron stars. Thank you. So pulsars, I suppose, to our listeners, um, they're like the lighthouse of the universe, aren't they? Yes. They're about the only ones that really um, uh, you can regulate things from them. Um, it's such an interesting thing and, and they're about when they when the star implodes on itself and they end up the, about the size of Melbourne. Yeah. What fascinates me, you take a teaspoon of a neutron star, I can't remember the statistics but the weight of it, it, is, it blows your mind, just a teaspoon of it. I think I just read yeah. I could be off by an order of magnitude but it's about 4,000 billion tonnes in a... <laughs> teaspoon of of neutron star um yeah. they weigh as much as like twenty thousand empire state buildings if you want to put that in just interesting units and yeah it's so studying neutron stars is so interesting because we have no idea how matter behaves at those kinds of densities and that would also help us to understand how matter behaved in the beginning of the universe when it was really dense yeah that's a whole area of physics that neutron stars are really interesting for um and it, we can't create conditions like that here in a lab so it's the mm. only way to study that kind of thing so getting to pulsars, mm -hmm. we know they rotate. Yeah. And some of the rotation figures that you see out there could be up to um, something in the order of 717 turns per second. Am yeah. I, am I right? Yeah, that's is right. That the, is that the limit of what you know of when you count how many turns there are per second? I'm trying to do the maths in my head. Mm. Um, millisecond pulsars are rotating, I guess, can be thousands of times per second. So thousands. there are higher – you kind of have two classes of pulsars. You have your general pulsars that spins on the order of, of seconds or tens of seconds and then you've got your millisecond pulsars that are going much, much faster. In terms of the fastest pulsars we've observed, it would be around that one, two, three millisecond regime to my knowledge. And then there's also theoretical limits on how fast a pulsar can spin because you can't have the surface spinning faster than the speed of light. No, right? that's what I thought. Yes, yeah. but – we don't see all the pulsars because obviously they have to have, um, like you said, the lighthouse effect. We only yeah. see a lighthouse if the light sweeps past us. Yeah. So there are lots of pulsars out there that we can't see just because their beams aren't pointing towards That's us. Right. So there could definitely be faster spinning pulsars out there. So the next question is how do you detect 
the rotation speed and the numbers of rotations per second. How is that done? We use um, radio telescopes across the globe. Here in Australia, we're mainly using the Parkes radio telescope. And um, now, because we've been observing pulsars for a really long time, we know where they're going to be in the sky. So we point our telescope there and then um, we just observe the radio frequency flux from them. And they're kind of like, they go like ping, 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 ping. So we just observe how regularly that pulse happens. And then, then from that, we can understand that, you know, they do one rotation per pulse. But it's really fun because there's a lot of other interesting things going on that we also have to account for. If the pulsar was just out there spinning in a complete vacuum, then that would be all we have to worry about. But pulsars um, do spin down over time due to the drag from the magnetic field. There's dust between us and the pulsar. The, the Earth is moving, the sun is moving, the galaxy is moving. So there's a lot of really intricate details that we also have to account for to understand the pulsar rotation period. And there's a limit like all stars. They have a use-by date. Um, how long does a pulsar last for? Do you know? Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Uh, millisecond p- pulsars specifically are very, very stable. Yeah. But pulsars do die. There's um, a line in a plot you can make of the pulsar period and the pulsar spin down called the pulsar death line. And so they do at some point stop emitting. But as I mentioned earlier, we don't actually understand the emission mechanism. So we don't understand what's causing them to stop emitting. But in general, they are quite stable objects, so we aren't seeing that happening super often. And last time we met, you talked about the jitter. Yes, yes. I know there's jitters and other, you know, um, uh, types of things out there in the universe. But what glitches as well? Oh yeah, we can talk about glitches. <laughs> and the, and the I love the terminology. Can you explain that to us. <laughs> I get <Sure>. the jitters. <laughs> <laughs> so. I mean, everything in the universe is stochastic and random. There's always fun things going on that you have to account for. But pulsars specifically exhibit jitter and that word just talks about um, random pulse-shaped changes. And so um, like any object that's spinning, it's going to have little shakes and little wobbles in it. And so that's going to cause the pulse shape to vary a small amount all the time. There's always random variations kind of happening in everything. But um, you also touched on glitches and they're really cool because I keep talking about how how regular pulsars are and they're great timekeepers, but they do exhibit this wild phenomenon called glitches where they all of a sudden start spinning faster. And I, the reason that I think they're really interesting is because when you have an object that's, that's that heavy spinning that rapidly, you're going to require a huge amount of force to disrupt that regular spin of it. And so um, we, again, glitches are another thing that we don't fully understand, but we think the force that is required to make that happen must come from within the the pulsar itself because it's the only thing that could really generate that amount of force. Um, And the current theory is that there's a a star quake, you can kind of akin to an earthquake on the star, and lots of angular momentum that's stuck on the inside of the pulsar is, is pushed to the outside and it starts spinning faster. It's nothing to do with the wobble. Like you see no, they're, with they're yeah. kind of separate phenomena. Separate phenomena. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. How many types of pulses are there? You mentioned a couple before. But um, yeah, there's so many different types. It's kind of like everything. It depends on how you want to classify them. So the main two categories, at least in, in pulsar timing, are your regular pulsars or garden variety pulsars, as we sometimes call them, and then your millisecond pulsars, which are the millisecond pulsars are the bread and butter of timing. Um, And so your regular pulsars are from your classic pulsar formation. You have big star collapses, starts spinning, starts emitting in radio frequencies and those have spins on the order of seconds like I said before. And then your millisecond pulsars spin much faster and the only way to make that happen is for them to have some sort of binary interaction, so to interact with another star sorry, that somehow speeds that up. Um, And so that's the kind of the two main classes of pulsars. You also have magnetars, which are even highly more magnetized than regular pulsars. And they're really interesting Mm. because they have, they're not um, like millisecond pulsars are characteristically very reliable, very chilled out pulsars in terms of the fact that they're not glitching all the time and things like that. But magnetars are always having really big extreme events going on. So they're really interesting to study. 
I'm just in awe of magnetars. It was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> what was the difference between a pulsar and a magnetar? <laughs> yeah, so the magnetars just have these really, really strong magnetic fields and um, we think that magnetars could be the source of many unexplained astronomical phenomena. It's really hard to say, but for example, we don't know what fast radio bursts are and they recently won the Shaw Prize, which is called the Nobel Prize of the East, so it's a big deal. <laughs> um, and we just we just... Yeah, we don't know where they come from, so that could be a possible source. I read, just in, in my background uh, reading for this, this mm-hmm. interview, I think it was about 3,300 pulsars in our Milky Way. Is, is That's the latest number we, that have been found and confirmed? Yeah, that's, a, that's around um, yeah. the figure that I would say for how many pulsars we know of. But again, like I said earlier, that's probably way, way more yeah. because they're not all – don't all have their beams passing Earth and then also some – pulsars aren't emitting anymore and so we can't see them. And I think there was, just on memory, there was 300 outside our Milky Way that they're, they're finding. My next question was that getting back to this radio waves versus gamma rays, we're talking about the large radio waves on mm-hmm. this electric magnetic spectrum. Are they more radio wave pulsars than gamma ray pulsars or can they be mixed or not? So you can have pulsars that emit in gamma rays and radio waves. And at the moment in our sample of pulsars that we know of, we have many more radio wave pulsars than gamma ray pulsars. But that quite possibly isn't because there's more radio pulsars in the galaxy. It's because gamma rays uh, are much harder to detect. We need space-based telescopes to do that. They're just much more difficult to build and they have a much smaller field of view so we can't look at as much of the sky. Whereas radio telescopes, I mean, a satellite dish is a radio telescope, so they're much easier to build so they're much easier to detect. So looking at the cosmological um, constant, the mm-hmm. inflation of the universe, as yeah. I'm sure you're very aware of, um, is it inf- are pulsars influenced by the expansion of the universe or do they stay still? They would have to be, wouldn't they? expanding out with the rest of the universe itself? Well, for timing specifically, we look at galactic pulsars, so ones within the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is gravitationally bound enough that it's not affected by the expansion of the universe and dark energy. I guess if you had um, really good kind of long baseline measurements for an extra galactic pulsar, you might be able to measure that a bit better. But I think the best measurements of inflation and, and Hubble constants and that kind of thing come from when we see neutron star merges and we're able to measure them in gravitational waves. And that's where multi-messenger astronomy really comes into play. When we had the first um, neutron star merger that we also saw on the electromagnetic spectrum, that was the first time that we had a really robust way to test that gravitational waves moved at the speed of light because that was a theory but we hadn't been able to test it. And so I think um, the gravitational wave spectrum will be uh, much more informative for those kinds of measurements. What happens at the end of a pulsar's life? Uh, That's a great question. Uh, I guess defining the end of a pulsar's life is hard, but from our point of view, it would be when they stop emitting in the radio and we can't see them anymore. And exactly that happens. We aren't able to observe them. So we don't know what happens entirely, but um, we can be pretty confident that they're still out there in the galaxy, spinning around um, and, and getting slower over time. But the spin down is very slow. So in all likelihood, they'll just be sitting there spinning till the end of the universe, slowly losing some energy through that, but not in an extreme way. So, yeah, they're just sitting there and we can't see them anymore. So they wouldn't be like a supernova and just implode and explode again and become something else? No, because the the neutron star degeneracy is still holding them up against gravity. So the only way you could – I mean, you could kill a a pulsar in an explosive event if you (laughs) merge it with something else or throw some stars at it. You know, you could cause it to collapse into a black hole. But if we're just talking a solitary pulsar just out there relaxing in the universe, it'll just eventually slow down to the point where it doesn't emit uh, any radiation anymore and it'll just keep sitting there. One more question if I may. When you go supernova and there are obviously different um, sizes of stars that cause a black hole and all go into a neutron star, what's your take on this? Uh, we look at solar mass mm-hmm. of, say, um, something that's within 10 solar masses. Is that definitely going to become a neutron star or a black hole? Or is the dividing line when that, when that decision comes that it's going to be definitely a black hole or definitely a neutron star? Yeah, that's a great question. So 
from eight to ten solar masses, yeah. that's kind of the line between low mass and medium yeah. mass. So below that, they just turn into a white dwarf. But in terms of the line between neutron stars and black holes, the answer is we don't really know. Mm. And when we talk about neutron star mergers, we're really unsure what object comes out of those kinds of mergers if it goes straight to a black hole if there's a short-lived neutron star or if there's a long-lived neutron star the answer is we don't know and that's because we don't fully understand the neutron star equation of state so that's how the radius changes with the density of the neutron star and that's because we don't understand how matter behaves at those kinds of densities so that's an open field of research and if we were to understand the equation of state we would be able to draw that line a bit more clearly you have so much ahead of yourself. <laughs> this is such an uh, such an unknown area. So, will you become um, a PhD? Yeah. Um, I think you'll have a lot of work on your head. Oh, there's so much to do. There's so much to do. So uh, yeah. that again. Yeah. After your PhD success, where would you like your career to head? I'd like to stay in pulsar timing and pulsars. Yeah. They've really won my heart. They're amazing objects. I would love to join a pulsar timing collaboration maybe overseas and continue the work that they're doing to better understand the gravitational wave background. That's been the hot new thing in pulsar timing lately and we've found very early evidence of it, which is cool, but I think the really juicy science will be in understanding how it works and what's going on there. So I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on some of that data and trying to understand it a bit better. I think we're going to lose this doctor to uh, overseas. Doctor overseas for a while before <laughs> she comes back to Monash. It's pretty standard to like <laughs> yeah. go away and yeah. come back, but come yeah. back. I would love to come back. Oh, I do love it here. Well, good luck. Well, good we luck. hope you come back too. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Rowena, thank you so much for sharing your insights uh, about pulsar timing yeah. and multi-messenger astronomy on Spaced Out Down Under. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, It's Rowena. a pleasure. I love the local news. I love the music variety. And all the local sport. 24 hours a day, it's all local. 88.6, Plenty Valley FM.